Hi. Good morning. My name is uh, Harry Soin from Advanced Energy. And this is a presentation which is uh, being done with, between Advanced Energy, Delta, and Light On. Unfortunately, Ralph uh, could not make it because of uh, COVID restrictions. So we will start with his part. We will play his part first. And then, then uh, uh, Lam and I will complete the presentation. Thank you. All right. Let's hope this thing works. In Germany. Unfortunately, I can't join in person due to COVID travel restrictions, but I guess this recording will work as well. My friend Harry Zoin, Senior Director of Artisan Embedded Power, will present the second part of this presentation. And then Lam Wu, Director of Light On Technologies, will do the third part. After that, we are open for questions and discussion. The content. I will start with a short recap of the V3 spec. This is followed by a new requirement we call hold up time during overload or design two. Then I show our activities on the design of a dummy load box. And I will end my part with an overview about the common V3 PMC, the power um, shelf controller with I2C and PMBUS communication. Harry will give an efficiency update, the PFC and THD update, as well as the rectifier to BBU transition. Lam will present the BBU transition as well, and he will focus on the fault cases. He will finish with the current share results between power shelves. Okay, the short refresh on the OAV3 spec. First of all, the rectifier. So the input voltage range uh, is from 180 volt AC to 305 volt AC. The nominal voltages are 240 and 277 volt. The output power is 3000 watt. The output voltage is 50 volt if AC is present and 48 volt if the BBU is running. The output current is 60 amp. The hold up time 20 milliseconds. The peak efficiency is 97.5%. It's around 50% load. And the full load efficiency is 96.5%. The current share is achieved by an active share and a voltage group. For communication, um, we have I2C and PM bus, as well as RS485 and Modbus communication. The size is 73 millimeter wide, one RU high, so 40 millimeter, and the depth is 520 millimeter. So this power supplies can be um, used in the power shelf it has six slots and one slot for the PMC on the left side. The output power in the N plus one redundancy is 15 kilowatt. So the installed power is 18 kilowatt. As well as the rectifier, the output voltage is also 50 volt if AC is present and 48 volt in BBU mode. The total shelf output current is 300 amps nominal, and the output connector is the um, FCI 500 amps bar clip called BK500. There are also other vendors offering now the, the output connector. Um, the communication is Ethernet via PMC. I will come to this later in my PMC presentation. And the size of the shelf is a 21 inch wide, one OU high, so 48 millimeter, and the depth is 778 millimeter. Now I will show the hold up time during overload or design two requirements. On the scope build, you see in blue the AC input voltage, which um, stops after a while. Um, the orange 
trace is the output current. You see uh, we jump from 0 amps to 150% and the uh, green curve is the output voltage. During the AC is present and the um, output current is zero, um, we see a slightly higher output voltage than the 50 volt. And when the output current kicks in, uh, then the voltage um, drops to 50 volt roughly. This is due to the droop. Then you see after 10 milliseconds, the power supply will reduce the output voltage actively to 48 volt to wake up the battery. We can achieve with our power supply in total more than 16.6 .6 milliseconds during this 150% output load step. From the specification, the unit has a 20 millisecond hold up time at 100% load. This equals 60 joule of stored energy in the bulk capacitance. Um, if you calculate linearly um, to a 150% load, you end up at a minimum requirement of 13.3 milliseconds. This is uh, 9 milliseconds for the power supply to keep the, the 50 volt voltage constant. And then 4 milliseconds where the power supply reduces the output voltage to 48 volt to wake up the BBU. So the BBU needs roughly 1 millisecond for the detection that it needs to wake up and then 2 to 3 milliseconds to ramp up the DC-DC converter to support the output load. So therefore the minimum time for this um, BBU wake up is 4 milliseconds. The next is the dummy load box. So we developed a um, dummy load box as you can see here. So it's a 3 OU high box. Uh, the width is 21 inch. The depth is the same like the um, depth of the power shelf. It's 787 millimeter. And um, this dummy load box consists of 8 times 500 watt TTV. So this is thermal test vehicle load. So in total, we have installed four kilowatt and the uh, power is adjustable by, by this um, potentiometer on the front. Um, we also have a hot swap controller, so you can hot plug this uh, dummy load box. We have a MCU installed to control the fan speed, so there are also fans installed. Dummy load box has the same input connector like the um, IT gear. So it's a 100 amp bar clip. Um, there is no communication. And on the right side, you see the, the rear view with the IT gear connector. So the block diagram from left to right. So the input uh, power comes from the bar clip out of the um, bus bar. So it's 40 volt or 48 volt, depends if the AC um, is present or if the BBU is running. Then we have an analog devices hot swap controller with four MOSFETs. Um, then we have two DC-DC converters. We generate a 12 volt for the MOSFET drives of this TTV loads. And we also generate 3.3 volt internally for the MCU. So the MCU gets um, the load settings and the fan speed settings from this potentiometers as an input, as well as the Tacho signal from the, from the four fans. And the output is the PWM to the fans, so the speed is adjustable. And um, the PWM signal for this eight TTV loads. So we did a 45 degree phase shifted um, gate drive pulse that we have um, a smooth yeah, load distribution that we don't have um, some kind of load steps when we turn on and off this TTV loads. So the TTV loads are actually 
uh, resistive loads. On the right side, you, you can see the, the stack up. So the, the bottom part is this TTV, the thermal test vehicle. And um, there is a big heat sink attached. So this is a real heat sink, which is also used in the servers. And on the left side, you can see the open box. So you can see the eight heat sinks or eight TTV um, blocks. And you see the four fans in the rear and the airflow direction is from the front to the rear. This is actually um, to play around with the power shelf if you don't have the servers or the real load. Now I come to my last part. So this is the um, PMC, the management controller. So uh, on the left side, you see my page from last year's presentation. Um, I introduced that we want to do a two-step approach. So the first step was um, that we have a PMC light which collects all the PM bus signals from the PSUs and uh, report this via I2C and the communication box to the USB port of a Windows PC. And we could run a, a GUI to check all the PM bus um, registers of the six power supplies. Um, as a step two, I introduced the PMC with the OpenBMC and Ethernet communication. And yeah, this year we we are at the step two. Now we have the first samples of this um, shelf controller you see on the bottom. And um, in the middle, on the right side, um, you see the, the block diagram. So we start from the bottom with the device tree. So this is the hardware configuration. Then we have Linux kernel with the SM bus and PM bus drivers, as well as the EEPROM driver to talk to the EEPROM inside the shelf. And then we have some customer specific um, data, EEPROM and FruID, a temperature handler, an LED handler, the PSU handler to be able to talk to the power supplies and fetch the data. And we have some service journal for logging. So all the stuff runs under Redfish and the REST API. And we have, have a web UI um, where you yeah, can log in into the shelf and, and monitor all the, all the power supplies and what's going on. On this page, you see another more detailed block diagram. So on the left side, you see up to 12 power supplies. So we can also use this um, shelf controller in the 2OU shelf with 12 PSU slots. The PMC itself is also fed by the 50 volt bus or the output voltage of, of the units inside the shelf. Uh, we also have a hot swap controller and uh, we generate 12 volt and 3.3 volt. Um, we have an EEPROM on the PMC for MAC address and uh, through data. And we also have, um, as I said before, an EEPROM inside the shelf for a manufacturer information. And the PMC is also able to talk to this um, EEPROM inside the shelf. So the PMC itself um, has a one giga bit Ethernet port to be able to talk to the service host. And it's able to do, for example, the firmware update of, of all the power supplies. We also have some debug ports, an RS232 interface. Yeah, and the PMC also um, checks all the digital inputs uh, like PS present, AC OK, PM bus alert, stuff like this. So this is the end of my part of the presentation. Here you see our power supplies, power shelves and the dummy load. So if you are interested, please contact me. You see my email address. And now I hand over to Harry. Thank you. 
Hi there, so just give me a second to transition to the other part. Okay. All right, that wasn't that wasn't too bad. All right, this thing works. Okay, perfect. So we're in business. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Harry Soin of uh, Advanced Energy. Uh, I'm a senior technical marketing director responsible for the hyperscale space. I'm located right here in San Jose, and I will be providing the brief uh, update on uh, uh, ORV3 Power Shelf. My presentation is divided into two parts. I'll start with the key performance parameters, as Ralph mentioned, on efficiency and power factor correction, THD, and then we will transition to a PSU to BBU transitions. All right. So if you remember during the last presentation, uh, we had some work to be done. We were slightly behind the of the, the efficiency, the 230 volt uh, peak efficiency, and I'm glad to report that we have uh, not only met and exceeded the efficiency targets for both uh, full load and peak efficiency at 230, 240, and 277 volts. And in fact, you know, at 277, we are almost approaching 98% efficiency. So, you know, I think team has done a good job in uh, improving this part uh, uh, of the performance. Moving on. Uh, this is the update on uh, ITHD and uh, power factor correction. Uh, as, uh, as you know, as the current gets lower at lower loads, uh, the current is due to current distortion, it becomes quite challenging to, to meet uh, ITHD and power factor. Uh, so, but, but nonetheless, I think this is a great accomplishment from the presentation we did last time. Uh, great work has been done, and uh, there's only slight improvement to be had at 5%. And I guess once you improve ITHD, power factor will follow. And uh, I look forward to uh, you know, providing you complete spec compliance uh, during the next update. All right. So now we transition to the most exciting part, which is uh, uh, PSU to BBU transitions. Uh, in, in this case, there are quite a few test cases we need to go through. And how does this happen? So initially, uh, when AC disappears or load happens, you know, the, the PSU maintains its voltage at 51 volts for a certain amount of time, and then it moves down to 48 volts. So at 48 volts, it needs to stay for a minimum amount of time, which in this case is about four milliseconds uh, in the worst case, so that the BBU can uh, wake up, do the handshake, and either two of them share current or BBU uh, takes over. So there are a few key cases here during that. The first case is when the AC is lost. When the AC is lost, uh, the PSU will uh, you know, stay at 51 volts till 66% of its energy is depleted. And then it transitions to 48 volts, so the BBU can come on. Uh, and that's, that's the first part of the transition. A uh, second part is you know, the, the, the overload, overpower in the current conditions. Uh, 3.3 kilowatts for 10 seconds, 3.6 kilowatt for 100 milliseconds. There's a predefined envelope of uh, you know, the, the repetitive power pulses or a single overload condition, uh, which is right at the bottom, which is you know, up to 150% load, uh, but not to exceed the maximum, uh, the, the bulk energy there, right? So those are the cases we're gonna go through, and I'm gonna show you in two parts. First how does the PSU behave stand alone if any of these occurrences do happen? So we're gonna go through those cases, look at the signals, and then we will put the PSU and BBU together and look at the complete overall pictures, you know, see whether all these things are being met properly or not. All right, the first part. So I'm not gonna walk you through the boring details of the six cases, so we will emphasize on just a couple of them to see how things are happening. So this is the AC loss at 100% of the load, all right? So the key things, as I talked about, if you remember, like at 51% of the, at 51 volts, this is where the PSU is at all the time. It maintains 11.6 uh, milliseconds uh, or 66% of the bulk energy before the transition happens. And then, see, it drops down here to 48 volts. See, here AC is already gone. Uh, and this is the, the this is the the I out and you know I out disappears and that so you're getting a complete picture as to what's happening. The second important test case is when there is 150% overload. This is this is really really important. See what's happening here? 
uh, the, the PSU maintains its uh, 51 volts, drops down to 48. And what's really important, remember I mentioned four millisecond? We are actually exceeding uh, that target. We are at about 4.8 milliseconds here. And here, since this is an overload, you will see the ice shirt is trying to supply more current. And, and then, you know, when this is over, it, it comes down, the PSU is shut down there, right? So again, as I mentioned, I'm just, these are the pictures of, this is the, 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 the adjust, other load, like 3.6 kilowatt for 100 milliseconds. You see a similar behavior the PSU is doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, moving on, this is uh, when the, the envelope we talked about, the repetitive peak pulses, they are happening. This is, a, this is defined in your ORV3 spec. All the details are there. And all I'm trying to show here is the compliance to that spec, like it's happening here. Again, the other course was a single pulse uh, of up maximum up to 150%. And same behavior is expected, and PSU, sh PSU will shut down and try to wake up again after 10 seconds to see if, if, if the trouble has gone away. It could come back and try after 10 seconds. So these are all the cases. And you see that the PSU is behaving as expected. All the signals are there, which we talked about. And now we're going to transition to the, the real application where, so this is, this is a setup in a lab, uh, in, a, in a design team setup. So, you know, you see your PSUs and your uh, PSUs at the bottom and the BBUs, and this is the actual setup. And what we are trying to show here is what's really happening here. So there's six PSUs, six BBUs, and AC loss. So here, you see from this voltage here, you know, what's happening to the voltage. The, here, the AC has disappeared. Uh, this is... From here, the PSU is trying to supply more current, and here BBU comes on. And during this transition, both of them are sharing power, all right? So this is PSU and BBU working together. Uh, another test case here is this is, we can call it peak shaving, essentially at uh, pulse overload condition. Uh, so your, your channel one shows the output voltage. Here you see your uh, 51 volts going down to 48 volts. Uh, your, uh, what you're seeing, this is really important. So during that condition, the PSU tries to supply more power. And you can see this is 51 volts at this time, and the BBU is still asleep. The voltage drops down here to 48 volts. Uh, the PSU power is being shared. The BBU is coming up. Both of them are supplying power in unison here. So this is, this is the real application as to how it actually happens. So, with that, that brings me to the end of the technical part of the presentation. And, uh, you know, so I'm going to talk about essentially at the end, what do we have uh, at our Artisan, uh, artisan uh, AE booth? I look forward to seeing you all there and showcase uh, our power shelves there, which uh, our teams have, have been working on. Uh, this is the ORV3 1OU power shelf, 3 kilowatt block, giving you a total of 18 kilowatts of power. Uh, the two positronic connectors, the bar uh, click connector for the, for the bus bars. Uh, we are also working on three to five kilowatt power supplies uh, to be a part of either this or a two OU power shelf, which employs uh, the Harding uh, connectors because of the higher AC input uh, and, the bar, and the bar clip connectors uh, stacked up together. So with, with that, uh, that brings me to my presentation. I'll hand it over to to Lam, uh, who's going to talk about uh, later. Sure. I mean, the time is short, so I'm not going to talk about more about the transition because you already uh, see all the transitions uh, between the power supply, PSU, and battery. So I'm going to skip that part of it. Um, and I want to talk about, um, you know, if you have two, I mean, you, you can have a one power shell, right? So what if you need more power shell in the rack? I mean, what happened if you, then if you have two power shelves, then what is the current share between these power shelves? So I just want to talk about these results a little bit, okay? I mean, there are two possibilities, you know, because the, 
the PSU, the um, the shell controller has the current sharing signal analog going to one of the RJ45. So if you connect these RJ45 together, basically you can connect the uh, current, the active current share signal between the two power shell together. So once that happens, you can see that the current share between the PSU between these two power shell are very good. I mean, it within 3% as required of the spec, okay? And in other cases that the power, sh there's no connection between power shell, then because of the droop uh, characteristic of the power supply, so there will be some current share between them uh, with some more error because of the, um, tolerances between uh, voltage setting um, of the different PSU. And you can see that, you know, even though um, the current share is not as good, but it's still um, within tolerance of the unit. I mean, the higher unit still below 110%, which, um, which for, at, for light on, I mean, we will not shut down even in that cases. So you can see that the um, highest one is about 62 M and the lowest one is about like 56.5 M. So they are still within at least um, five to 10% differences, okay? So that would be all of the, um, I mean, you are welcome to come to our booth at um, a Lion booth and look at um, the sample that we have. And we also have a um, live demonstration of the system that we have in our lab that uh, we can remotely connect to it and you know, remotely control so you can also see the transfer um, between the PSU and the, um, and the BBU. And with that, uh, we will take some questions. So if you have some questions, um, Harry and I will, and Ralph on the phone will try to answer these questions. Okay, I'm gonna go to my earlier question about the output of the BBU. Are you going to make it regulated or are you gonna take the BBU decays over time if the, the AC also still exists? The BBU, uh, output voltage is, is regulated from the um, start point to the point it shut down. There's no t no time in between that the output of the BBU will be our regulations. Oh, but so uh, if if the AC loss still exists, the AC loss will exist. Then when at the end of this chart, the it will shut down. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. After how long is gonna shut down? It's gonna say 48 for how long and then it starts shut down. The BBU, not the AC to DC power supply. Uh, this is kind of kind of and it depends on how much energy it's So, you know, it could be up to five milliseconds or it could be up to five seconds or it depends on how much energy Okay. But now you guarantee that the 48 will be regulated all the time. 48 will be regulated, yeah. Thank you. Uh, with ORV3, you're going to be supporting 48 volts versus 12 for ORV2, and it looked like all, most of the output voltages for the shelves were at 48 volt. Right. Um, what do you expect in terms of the mix between 12 volt racks at ORV3 versus 48? Are they all going to 48, or will you also still uh, be seeing some that, that do 12 volt output? Uh, I can speak on for, for advanced energy. We are seeing a, with all the NVIDIAs and AMDs, all the power going up, and the, the, a lot of pressure on the current, right? The current says, you know, as the power doubles, the current goes up by a factor of four. Your right square R loss has gone by 16. So in nutshell, we see a lot of conversion to 48 volts. Right. Right. Thank you. Just to add on that, uh, the rack support both 12 and 48 volt. Uh, we are just focusing on the 48 volt. Somebody else is interested. They can work on the 12. There is no that much interest with, as Harry mentioned, on 12 moving forward. How do you see the transition to high power rack 
are going to stay between 10 to 20 kilowatt rack, or are you going to see a transition to 50 and 100 kilowatt, have the adaption for higher power rack? Yeah, I believe there are interests for some special racks to go higher and higher power, and we are going to work on that to increase the power density. Uh, right now, the design is as such that you can actually add more power shelf and BBU. The, resi the design is very res scalable. Uh, is very uh, scalable and modular, so you can add more and more. The only penalty is a space that we lose a space. But uh, after this project, we are going to focus on more higher power PSUs and shelves that can actually go bring the rack to 50 or more kilowatt. Thank yeah. you. I believe we are out of time. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So uh, there is a forum Q and A at uh, I believe. Uh, at the second presentation from now, I come back with your questions.